Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to the rescheduled Q&A. the first here on Facebook, so you do win the Facebook sweeps, sweepstakes. Looks like Jonathan P. is the first one uh, tuning in through YouTube. Let's see here. Uh-oh. Looks like maybe I did accidentally make this <laughs> For those of you joining me on YouTube, I am thinking probably what's happened is this is normally something I only make available on an unlisted YouTube video. This is a question and answer session uh, for my piano students. You're more than welcome to be here, but if, if you're here hoping for a concert, that's not what we're doing today, and I just botched it and forgot to schedule it as an unlisted video. <laughs> But, uh, some of you are probably in uh, the members section at the Piano Man Approach tuning in through YouTube there. But anyway, yeah, that's, uh, once a week I get together with some folks in my Facebook group and we do some questions and answers based on their questions about the Piano Man Approach and just other questions about music in general. I've already got a bunch of really, really good ones uh, banked up here that I need to address. We usually go for about 90 minutes, and I'm hopeful that I'll be able to get through all of the ones that were sent in advance. And if not, we'll uh, pick it up on Friday. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Elliot. I'm sorry, Elliot. I didn't realize that that was being asked. Uh, I do. I don't do a ton of that, but I I can. It's just not part of my um, usual shtick. But uh, yeah, I do like Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Dean Martin and Andy Williams and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm not I'm not an expert at it, but I'm I'm competent at it. Hi, Anne. Yeah, no, it's great music, Elliot. I don't have anything against it. It just sometimes doesn't seem to... It, it's like not top of mind for me in a lot of the shows that I do. But uh, but I love that kind of stuff. It's great music. The American Songbook. I made a little bit of a botch here, cartoonist guy. This actually isn't a concert. Uh, this is a question and answer session for my piano students, and I normally send these to YouTube as an unlisted video, but I accidentally sent it out as a public video this time. So I'm going to have a lot of people tuning in thinking that it's actually a concert. Uh, but if you come back on uh, Sunday when I do my next live stream concert, I'd love to do some Bob Dylan. Thanks. Hey there, if you are on Facebook and you're getting this where I pull up your uh, comment and it's got a blank face and a blank uh, name there, in the description on Facebook it says, um, toward the bottom it says, I'm streaming live through StreamYard. Please give StreamYard permission to show my profile name and picture and then it will allow that to go through so that it looks like this instead. Hey, Chris. Yes, it, you know, uh, that's, as it happens, the update issue, the technical issue I had on Friday, it wasn't the update per se, but 
something in the process of downloading the update um, caused my computer to no longer uh, optimize its use of my RAM, my memory. And I had to get walked through some kind of a process that like reoriented the computer on that. And once it started f using the full capacity of its RAM, RAM memory, then uh, I didn't have any of those sluggish problems anymore. So we're back to normal. But yeah, that was pretty nerve wracking. Oh, no, it's not your fault, dude. It's mine. It's because I, uh, <laughs> I made this public thinking that I had made it private. Which it's not that I'm not happy to have you with us. I just, I just know there are going to be people who tune in expecting something that's not happening. So that's my bad. That's my bad. We're going to be answering questions about piano today. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm sure that I will get around to it. It's one that's on my list of things to do. But, you know, as I have, I've tried to answer this question, uh, people want to know on YouTube why I don't make more like Billy Joel and Elton John tutorials. I did so many of them early on. And it's really, it's, it's kind of a boring kind of a business answer. Uh, but the thing was that... I started out, I was going to try and sell those and I sold a few and then I realized that I could get myself into a whole lot of trouble <laughs> and didn't want to get into a copyright infringement battle. Uh, the licensing, unless you're, unless you're in a position to scale it dramatically, the licensing is so expensive. You really have to be doing like at least, at least three or $400,000 a year in sales just to be able to afford the licensing to do this. And I'm just, I'm not that big of an operation. So that's why I just took them to YouTube because on YouTube, there's already sort of a, a public license. Uh, they have ways where the, the publishers can monetize those videos through ad revenue. So it became something that's sort of a little bit of a promotional material for me and my course, but also just a public service back to the fans. And, um, and it protected me from getting in trouble because the worst thing that's going to happen on YouTube is if the artist gets persnickety about it, they'll just take it down. But that being said, the Piano Man Approach course is not really about teaching people how to play a song note for note for note for note. So I do that for Elton John and Billy Joel songs from time to time because I have such a special relationship with that fan community. But I, the bulk of my time is and must be uh, dedicated to the Piano Man approach, which is learning to, how to learn songs using chords, rhythm patterns, and improv techniques. And the problem with doing tons and tons of those tutorials, is in spite of how, how time-consuming they are to do, is that they, they bring people to me who want more of that and then are disappointed with what's in my actual course. So I try to do that, uh, you know, when I have time, and I certainly, I don't wanna, I, I still have so much love in my heart for Billy Joel and Elton John and the fan community and all of that. So I'm never gonna give it up completely, but it, it is not the top most priority because even with digital tips, it just doesn't compete. I make my living off of selling my course. So that's why I'm not more active in that wing of, of the things that I do, just because for me, it just simply is not scalable at a level that can cause me to actually make it a huge focus, buy the licensing, and then sell it and, you know, create like a reliable revenue stream off of it. You know, I've spoken with attorneys about it. I've, wor I've worked with consultants about it, just trying to figure out how I can best do that. But it's just not a, it's, it's just not a great option other than to do it for free on YouTube. And, and uh, so that's, that's why. But yes, Leningrad is a song that I assure you there will be a tutorial at some point for. It's probably one of the two or three next ones I plan to do for Billy Joel. So uh, keep an eye out.
I think the next three Billy Joel ones, and I'm not sure which order they'll be in, and I don't know what date they'll be out, but the next three I'm planning are Big Shot, This Is The Time, and Leningrad. So, okay. Hi, Brenda. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I, I understand. Uh, I have a lot of fans that came because of those Billy Joel and Elton John tutorials. So not at all, not at all backing away from it. I'm just saying that that's uh, the reason why I'm not making a new detailed Billy Joel tutorial every week is because, uh, one, I want people to know that my method works on more than just Billy Joel music. And two, it's not really my method to teach someone note for note. It's great to teach a signature line that way, but um, but that's not the the heart of what uh, what the piano man approach is really about. So, but never ever take that as me uh, not wanting to continue to participate in the Billy Joel nerd verse. <laughs> I'm sort of the chief Billy Joel nerd in my little universe anyway, and I always will be. So good to be, good to be with you. Okay, so uh, guys, there's a whole bunch of questions here. If you're just joining us one last time, I'm gonna say this and then, uh, then I'll kind of quit addressing it, but we've got people logging in. I, this is not one of my live stream concerts. I made a little boo-boo here. Every week I get together with uh, paid members of my site and at the Piano Man Approach and we do a question and answer session this way and I usually send it, I, I usually am streaming it in a Facebook group and then I also stream it to YouTube on, a, on an unlisted video that then my paid members have access to in the future, which is fantastic. It's just a great value add thing and then they can watch it on replay. Well, this time I accidentally sent it for public so there are people tuning in, which is absolutely fine. It's not that I have any problem with anyone being here. I just wanted you to understand why I'm not like playing a show. So I'm going to answer some questions here, and I'll just leave it public. That way, you know, some people can see this. But we do this once a week. One of the things that one of the things you get is part of the piano man approach, and I've got a whole bunch of great questions in advance of the Q and A that I'm going to start working myself through here. And we'll do what we can. I usually go for about 90 minutes, and uh, if I can't get all of these in, we'll be back Friday at uh, Friday at three o'clock, and uh, we'll pick those up as well as whatever else comes in. So. The first, the first question that I wanted to take is, they said, are there any shortcuts for playing seven chords? And this is from Ann Howes up in uh, Canada, I believe in Alberta. So Ann, I saw some, some answers and there were some, there were some good answers already just in your Facebook post. Um, this is my take on it. There's nothing wrong with using your left hand to drop down to that seven. So if you were, let's say that we're on a C chord, there's nothing wrong with playing that C chord like this and then just playing your chord up here. I don't personally like to do that and I'm gonna explain why and I'll show you how I prefer to do a shortcut on a seven chord. The number one thing that I don't like about it is that if you're playing piano by yourself, then I always look at the left hand as the bass guitar and the, the trap set, the drum trap set, okay? Which means that it's kind of in charge of the groove. And the groove needs to be clean as much as possible. So when you do this, that particular that particular interval between this note and this note, it's kind of muddy when you get down into those lower frequencies. See how it's kind of dissonance? And 
in a different way than even when you get up like an octave higher or here. The dissonance is there, but in a higher frequency of pitch or tone, it just doesn't have that muddy thing going on. So I like to keep my bass and drums a lot cleaner with my left hand. That's why I do so much in octave work or even single note work like that because I like to keep that bass as clean as possible so that it can focus on groove and less on on harmonic structure if you will so for for uh, simplifying a seven chord here's what I would tell you my preferred way to do it is to understand that if you're already playing C in the left hand like so you don't need it up here either. You don't need it up here too. So if you just want to play a three note chord, you can, instead of playing like that, you can just play these three. You can play those three. You can play these three. But, but notice how much cleaner it sounds voiced like this with one of my rhythm patterns, for example, we'll put it with the syncopated feel. See how much cleaner that is than this. So I'm not telling you it is wrong to put that dominant seven note in your left hand. I'm just telling you that I don't like to myself because my left hand and my method is to focus in on your left hand as sort of like the, you know, the center of gravity for the groove. And that's why, and so cleanliness is kind of next to godliness when you're talking about groove. And that's, that's just me. So if it were me and I were going to simplify it, I would just drop the, drop the root note. You don't need a C in your right hand if you're already playing in your left hand. And then you can play a three note chord and it's still plenty thick, plenty everything. So that's, I hope that that addresses what your question was. If you have uh, any follow ups on that, I'll be happy to look into it for you. Oh, this is an interesting offshoot question. Steven says, what about playing an octave of the dominant seven in the left hand? Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't do that. All right. If, if you see like C7 written as your chord, all right, then it implies that you need a C in the bass. So you wouldn't want to play B flat in the bass. But if you see C slash B flat, then it implies that you play the bass. It tell, it's telling you to put a C chord over a B flat bass. And then, yes, absolutely. I mean, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me by Elton John. Don't let the sun go down on me. That's what that is. It's a C chord over a B flat. So it's a particular kind of sound you can achieve with that. It's not terribly common, but you will see that. But in terms of if you just have someone write C7, no, you're going to want to play C in, in your bass. You only, ever do, you only ever play a different note than the name of the chord if there's a slash, and then to the right of that slash, there's a different note. Then it's telling you kind of like a fraction. This is C over B flat, okay? Okay. Hey, Martin, thanks for joining us. Uh, no, I have not met Michael Cavanaugh. I've heard of him. I haven't really, uh, I'm kind of terrible. I'm, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be like digitally antisocial. It's just that I'm so busy usually with my own little world of activities that unless someone kind of interjects themselves into my world, I, I don't even know what's going on outside of it. Uh, I'll tell you who I've really enjoyed getting to know, though, 
just super enjoyed getting to know that a lot of you have followed on YouTube is a fellow named Kevin Lawrence, who's a very talented singer, piano player, who also loves Billy and Elton and, and like me, plays a variety of other stuff too. And uh, he and I have enjoyed doing some shows together and we've become kind of kind of good friends. We haven't met in person, but we have a texting regime going back and forth, which is pretty fun. So, uh, yeah, no, it'd be fun. It, it'd be fun to, to, uh, to meet to meet Mike Cavanaugh and uh, trade a few licks with him sometime. I'd, I'd love that. I'd like to meet Mike Del Judas too. Um, so we'll see, you know, people have lives that, uh, the one thing, the one thing that I'm not, um, the one thing I'm, I'm always very respectful of with people who have busy schedules like that, who are public figures is, you know, if, if the, if the universe works it out for us to be in the same place at the same time or works out some kind of easy, harmonious way for us to meet, then I love, I love it. And if we become friends and keep in touch, I'm all about that. But, uh, I, I usually don't like seek it out too much just cause they've got enough people pulling on them as it is I'm trying to, trying to get a little, get a little space with them and, and, uh, you know, that's okay. I'm, I'm sure they appreciate it too, but uh, I just, I don't need to, I don't need to, to try and wedge myself in there too much unless it uh, comes together organically. But I'm sure he's very talented. If I'm not mistaken, Michael Cavanaugh is the guy that they had play the piano man in uh, Moving Out in the Broadway run. And I think he came from Las Vegas. I think he was playing at the piano bar at the New York, New York casino just down the road from me in Vegas about an hour away from where I live. And I think Billy Joel was doing a concert there. Uh, was doing a concert at uh, at uh, the MGM Grand and then went to that piano bar and saw this guy playing and uh, kind of recruited him for move, for the Moving Out musical right from there. So it's amazing. Right time, right place. It's awesome. Wouldn't it be nice if they would reverse the chord over the octave left to right? Um, maybe, but I, I think that I, I understand where you're going with that, and I, I, I think that uh, to me it makes sense though because it's like if you were reading it like a fraction from left to right and a slash. You always see this as the bottom number, and this is the top number. So it's like two-thirds, right? And so I read it that way, that it's, it's like top, bottom, C over B flat. So, I mean, once you get used to it and you see it more often, I think that that, that will go away. But I'm sure if they had done it the other way and I'd gotten used to it that way, then I would have that would have been the one that made intuitive sense to me. But I, I think of it more as top-bottom than I do left-right. But I can see how that could be confusing. Okay. Uh, tenths. I, I can, but I'm not very good at them. And I, and I don't mostly think they're that important, uh, at least for me. I, I'm, not, I'm not really like, um, you know... I'm I'm not really like a voicing Nazi myself. I mean, I'm don't get me wrong, I like I like uh precision playing, but I'm more of a mutter, you know. Uh I'm I'm more of an Elton John style player, meaning that I'm not precisely the same way every time. I don't have like this really like I haven't decided this is how that chord has to be voiced in exactly this way and then kind of like nail it that way and get really good at it. I'm more of a spur of the moment kind of thing and I'm more rhythmic. I'm not as I'm not the best in the world at like really and tenths are a very precision based um maneuver, you know. <laughs> You really have to you you really build the muscle memory to get your hand to stretch that far and then to get used to hitting things you know and attacking them cleanly like that and never really been something that I mastered and it's just not it doesn't really fit my style of playing my personal style of playing that well but uh 
So I can, but I can't do it well, and I don't know that I'll ever practice it enough to do it well. <laughs> okay, let me see here. Let's get back to these. Okay. Uh, inverted chords. So the melody note is on top. This is by George Starosta or Starosta. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, George, so forgive me. I'm just going to say them both just to make sure that I cover it. So what he wants to know is if he's playing the melody in the right hand, should he be practicing? Because I always teach that before you try to drop the melody in the right hand, if that's what you want to do, that you want to get an accompaniment version down first. You want to get your rhythm pattern under your hands. You want to get the chord progression under your hands because you always want to be giving your brain power to the topmost layer of what you're adding. So for me, when I'm playing a show, my brain power is largely going to singing and fills in between the singing. But during the singing, the, the main rhythm pattern that I'm playing and the chord progression and that kind of stuff... Those are kind of on autopilot. I really have those down, right? And so it's just that top layer. And the, the melody is kind of the top layer on this cake. So that's where you want your brain power going to. So what he was asking is when you're working up the accompaniment side of it so that you've really got your chords and your rhythm pattern under your hands, should you be mindful of trying to learn the chords so that they're in the inversion that the melody would be. And so in other words, let's say that the melody is here. Okay, so he's saying, should I be playing the chord here? As opposed to just That's not a terrible idea at all, George, but I will say I wouldn't let that get, I wouldn't really let that kind of get in your way. Like what I would hope over time will develop for you is that you want a C chord to not mean this. You just want it to mean these three notes and you want to be comfortable voicing it here or here or here. Okay, so that that is almost moving around through the inversions is kind of second nature. That's not necessarily where everybody is, and that's okay, and you don't have to be there to start enjoying playing. But you do want eventually to develop fluidity with these inversions of chords because they allow you to move around on the piano much easier. And then when it's not causing you to have to overthink it to play it in any particular inversion, then it really won't matter whether you learned it that way or not. But if it's helping you, if it's helping you to kind of follow the melody a little bit with the inversions of your chord, absolutely. The thing that's going to trip you up a little bit with that from time to time is that the melody is not always going to be a note that's in the chord you're playing, you know. The melody will generally be inside the scale. So if you're in the key of C major, most of your melody notes are going to fall in that range with the occasional what they call accidental. And that's when any of these notes show up. They'll be denoted with a flat or a sharp, but most of the notes in your melody are going to end up in that neighborhood in most songs. And so you could be playing an F chord, but a G or an E or a B could actually be part of the melody even while you're playing that F chord. So it's not always going to be possible to play an inversion of the chord that follows the melody, but there are other times when it will be. So, you know, use that as sort of your you know, you can use that as sort of a loose rule of thumb. Don't get caught up in it. Mostly just get the chords under your hands. Whatever inversion. Just get the chords under your hands and then work through the process one step at a time. And by the time you get to the melody, you'll be all right. You'll know what chord you're headed to. 
Okay? All right, let me cross that one off. Do you like my brand new technology I'm using here of pad and pen? Okay, okay. Uh, this is fun. Um, so this question is, how do I sit positioned at the piano? This is from Stephen Peachy. And Stephen, I just had this interesting conversation with my friend Kevin Lawrence the other day because um, we, we were both commenting on how we want to center our video camera so that we're sitting in the center of the video. And he's like, but I don't sit in the center of the keyboard. <laughs> so when you center me, the keyboard's not centered. And when you center the keyboard, I'm not centered. And that's kind of why I set this up this way, because now I've got this, and it's kind of fooling you so I can center myself and frame. It kind of makes you feel like I'm sitting dead center in this, but I'm not, because the edge here is right at the edge of the video frame, and then I got all this space over on this side. So here's how I sit. Uh, I have the, the sustain pedal, which on a regular piano would be the farthest one to the right, pretty much just on the inside of my knee. I feel like uh, if depends on whether you're from uh, England or if you're from the rest of the world, but in North America here, it's I sit about like I would if I were driving. I'm a little bit to the left of center. So in England, it'd be like you're in the passenger seat of a car. And the reason for that is your left hand really is going to stay, for the most part, below middle C, which is here. Your right hand can technically play all the way up and down here, but it's mostly going to be playing from here to here. That's where, like, 90% of your, your stuff is going to be. And your left hand has about two octaves that are pretty common to it as well, here to here. So this octave can be a little uncomfortable and up here can be a little uncomfortable, but most of what you're gonna do if you're sitting with that pedal just on the inside of your right knee is very accessible to you. So that's where I sit. And it looks like the conversation that you guys had on Facebook indicated as much, but uh, yeah. Good question. Really good question. Because it, it actually, there are implications. If you sit, if you try to sit too centered or too far to the left or right, you're actually, if you play a lot, you're going to put undue tension and strain on your wrists. So, and you're already going to get tight wrists if you play a lot as it is, and you're going to need to be keeping some stretching up just to make sure that you offset it. But there's no reason to exacerbate that. You know, you just want to make sure that you're sitting so that the bulk of where you're going to be playing is accessible to you pretty easily. Okay. I've had a long-standing rule that I've followed with great success in music, and that is if I ever feel like I'm working very hard, I'm doing something wrong. Now, keep in mind, when I say that, people always, people always misunderstand what I mean by that. I don't equate working hard as spending a long time with something or spending a lot of time with something. I equate working hard with it being a struggle. Okay, If I feel like I'm struggling with something, I'm doing something wrong. I'm trying something that's, I'm either doing it in a way that doesn't, vibe with my body or with my abilities at this moment and it's it painful physically or emotionally to do it or I'm attempting something that's too many orders of magnitude above my current skill level to really get any traction with and I need to break it back a level or two and reach for something a little more attainable right now doesn't mean that you won't get to where you were trying to get. You just need to climb the next rung. You know, when you're on a ladder, you really can only climb the rung that's in front of you. Um, so keep that in mind. This is not about how, how much you should practice. That's going to vary 
And, and also, here's the thing. Some people are going to practice a lot. Some people are going to practice a minimal amount. You can still be making progress, but I can't tell you how much to practice because some people are going to pick this up faster than others. Might just match their learning style. Maybe they've got life experience that makes it click faster. Who knows, all right? But the thing is, everyone's going to go at their own pace and everyone has their own life that's going to dictate how available they are to practice, okay? So you got you kind of got to just honor that, all right? But I can tell you that regardless of how much time you're putting in, feel for whether you're struggling or whether you're enjoying, whether you're allowing yourself to grow, okay? If it feels like, if it feels like, you know, I'm stretching myself, stretching yourself is okay, but struggling to the point where you get really frustrated and you want to bang your head against the, you know, against the piano or whatever, I promise you, <laughs> you're doing something a little bit wrong uh, that's not helping you grow, so that's that's the main thing and that goes for the physical mechanics of playing too if you're doing something that makes it too difficult to do this or this or this then something's off and you need to make an adjustment okay Let's see. There's a conversation going on in the comments. I love it when that happens. I like it when you all become friends. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Has anyone ever used the Yamaha Smart Pianist app? I have not, but perhaps someone else has. Sustain is sometimes way too much. Yeah, and I did make a video about that. It's on my YouTube channel, and it's in the Facebook group about how to use the uh, sustain pedal. It's actually pretty new, but here's the crux of it. I have, I have basically two rules of thumb. One is that every time you change chords, let up and come right back down. Two, if you play the same chord, if the song calls for the same chord to be played for more than one or for multiple measures in a row, um, I like to let up and come back down after every one to two measures because it just sort of resets the reverb that way. Because it's okay if a G chord is bleeding into another G chord, but at some point in time, you do want to give it that freshness. So... But I actually, I use a couple of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers songs to demonstrate my point. Um, so if you, uh, if you go into the Facebook group and do a search for sustain pedal, it'll actually bring that video right up and you can watch it and that'll give you some tips on how to do that. Correct, Dan. There's no wasted time when you're enjoying yourself. It is a, it is an indicator when you're enjoying yourself, it's an indicator that you're on the right track. And as far as what types of songs to use sustain pedal on, I use it on pretty much everything. There's almost no songs I don't use sustain pedal on. The, the real trick is just to be coming up and coming back down. At, you know, like I say, you always want to come up and down when you change chords um, as much as possible because you don't, you don't want the chords bleeding into each other. But, you know, piano without reverb is a little bit dead and a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, it, like I say, it doesn't really have any life to it. So I'm, I'm an advocate of using the sustain pedal, but you do need to use it uh, strategically so that you don't uh, just have that cacophony going in all the time. Okay, back to these questions. So this is fun. My friend Marcel Robichaud, 
Robichaud, sorry, I said that wrong, Marcel Robichaud, says, uh, we shall be free by Garth Brooks. What he wants to know here is, can I walk through that chord progression and give him an idea of what my rhythm pattern would be on a song like that? Okay. That song's in the key of G. And it's like, this ain't coming from no prophet. And it goes to an E7, which is kind of a strange chord progression. Then an A minor, C, E minor, G, E minor, G, C, G over B, D suspended 7. Okay, now, now we finally get into the crux of the song, and it's like... So what's happening here is this is essentially my syncopated feel, okay? But then I dress it up a little bit. So when the last child cries for a crust of bread, when the last man dies for just words that he says, it's just like GC, when there's shelter over. Okay, so what I'm doing is my favorite little dress up, and this is a little bit, um, rhythmically this can be challenging, but what I'm kind of doing is I, I call it the bounce. I put a little bounce in there. I'm adding that little, so normally the, the syncopated feel is just a heartbeat. Thump, 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 but this is thump. So I'm adding a bounce after the parts that are normally there. And in the right hand. Okay. And it comes out. And I'm not like a robot with it, you know, my right hand, but I've built up pretty good hand independence. So my right hand is just doing different kinds of little things, uh, you know, syncopations and fills and stuff. But the crux of it is dumb, but dump, bum, bum, but dump, 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 the bounce, bum, the bounce, dump, dump. And it's an offshoot of the syncopated feel. When the last child cries for a crust of bread When the last man dies for just words that he says When the shelter over the poorest tale Yeah, we shall be free A woman free So that's the, and then the same, it just stays on that same rhythm pattern So it's like G, E minor we shall back to G B free A C G A G stand straight A walk proud C we shall be free. One of my favorite rhythm patterns, and it works on a lot of things. Anything's got a little bit of that bounce. Uh, and you don't have to do exactly that with your right hand off of it, but it works well for that song. But that whole ba bump ba ba bump ba ba bump is something that can be a, a great variation on that syncopated rhythm pattern to uh, make things a little fuller, a little uh, bouncier, a little more, you know, has even a little more drive and skip to it. I think that's kind of what I'm doing with uh, like River of Dreams. Let me see. G 
just a matter of getting the independence down so that your your right hand can do other things. powerful technique if you can get the hand coordination down and I think the best way to start is what I was showing you with we shall be free bum ba bum 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 ba bum 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 if you can just practice that slow on one chord Eventually speed it up. Really, really powerful stuff. Great question there, Marcel. Thanks for asking. Great way to demonstrate one of my favorite variations on one of my most I on, on what I think is maybe the greatest and most important of all of the essential feels that I teach. The old syncopated feel. Okay, this is a fun question. This is uh, Faram Phil wants to know, are there any songs I could never feel comfortable performing? Phil, here's the answer to that question. Yes, but not because I don't think that I could find a way to do it musically. Just turning the fan on me. It's a little warm in this room right now. Not because I don't think I couldn't figure out a way to, to deliver it musically in a meaningful way. But there are some songs I would never feel comfortable performing because I don't like the song. <laughs> or another one would be, um, I just don't like my voice with that song. I mean, I'm I'm over this whole nonsense about songs have to be done in their original key. and no. The key was chosen based on the singer's voice. You know, there's this myth out there, well, the, the song itself is chosen. The, no, that's not true. That is not true. They, the song is always chosen based on the singer's voice. Now, they may choose in the studio to put it in a key where that singer's really going to have to push himself or herself to their very, very limit but they're still working off of that person's singing range, all right? They're working off that person's singing range and they're working off of a bunch of different factors like, do we want this to have a really, really intense feeling at this moment or do we want it to have a really easy feeling at this moment? Do we want it to feel like it's really high at this moment, okay? Because here's the interesting thing. People, when you're listening to a singer, if they're a decent singer, you're going to calibrate, without even realizing it, as a listener, you will calibrate yourself to that person's singing range. Okay? Not the song. You're going to calibrate to that person's voice. So when I do You're the Inspiration or Glory of Love, and I'm clear down here in like, it, well, let's take Glory of Love. Peter Cetera, who had a very high voice at the top of his career, did it in C. Okay, he was there. And then it eventually modulates to D flat. I, to do it uh, at my best, put it in either G or A flat. I think when I did my YouTube video, because I didn't have any other singing to do and I could just try and do like one good take on it or whatever, I think I did it in A flat and it pushed me to my top. All right. So I generally perform it in G when it's in the context of a show because, you know, you don't know what other wear and tear you're going to put on your voice and just, just to make sure I can hit all the notes and all of that. But you're going to hear it through the context of my range. So when I get to the high notes, even though I'm in A flat and he was in C and they're like one, two, three, like four half steps apart, okay? 
you're still going to get that sense of, oh, that's a really high note because it's a high note for me because you're hearing it calibrated to my voice. So that's how I always choose the key of a song for me to sing, okay? I choose it based on where is my voice going to be at the same place that this guy's voice was, you know? I want to be in the same place in my range that he was. I want to be in the same place in my endurance that he was in his, okay? That's how you choose it. And when you do that, it doesn't matter what key the song is in because you're going to hear the song through that, that filter of the singer. You know, um, That's how they chose the key for Hotel California. Don Felder came up with the whole, um, like the guitar, most of the guitar stuff and the chord progression, but he wrote it in E minor. And then when they got in the studio, they had to pick a key, and Don Henley's voice eventually moved it to B minor because that's where it needed to be. That's how these things are done. So I'm not a subscriber to, oh, the song just loses something when it's in a different key. What people usually are feeling when they say that is that they go and they hear their favorite artist, and that artist has dropped it because either their voice has deepened a little bit or more likely their ability to sing with good endurance at that same place is not where it once was. So it's like, uh, you know, I, but you can tell they can still hit that note under the right circumstances, but they don't trust themselves to be able to hit it well in the context of doing a two hour show. Okay. That's when it starts to feel low because you can actually hear that it's not as difficult for them to hit this note as it needs to be to match what you what you heard on the recording. When you hear on the recording, you're hearing the top of their range and it sounds a little too easy here. And that's that's usually why people feel like, "Oh, song loses something when it's not in its original key." You know, but if you go hear a different cover artist do it and it's the right key for them, and that's how I choose the key of a song when I write a song. I don't always end up recording it in the same key that I wrote it in. I just I write the song because I'm obsessed with the melody and the lyrics. And then I find the right key for my singing voice. And I bring in factors like that. What, do I want this to sound intense? Do I want it to sound easy? What parts of it do I want? You know, crescendos and whatever. Am I going to do this full voice? Am I going to do it falsetto? All these kinds of things come into factor and then you, you or factor in and you choose a key that's going to help deliver the emotional product that you're looking for. And that's how, that's how pretty much every song is always chosen if it's going to feature a lead singer. So, so I would say for me, it's not so much back to this other question here that started this. Are there songs I'm not comfortable performing? Songs that I don't feel like I'm going to do very well just because it doesn't, it, it uses too many of my weaknesses and not enough of my strengths. Doesn't mean that I couldn't do it. Doesn't mean that, you know, I'm insufficiently set up to, you know, deliver some version of it. But like, if I'm, if it's my choice, you know, I'll be like, eh, I don't know. There's, there's a hundred songs I can do that I think really, capitalize on what I'm really good at and why why bother doing this one that capitalizes on things I'm less good at so that would be why but God knows I've played weddings and things where they've had a specific song they've wanted me to do that capitalizes on things I'm not good at but that's the song they want so I just figure out a way to do it but when I'm in control of my set list Songs that I really hate, I usually don't play. And songs that I just feel like don't draw on my strengths as a singer, I don't do. So, there you go. Cross that one off. Let's take a look at the comments here. Wheat Projects, this great explanation on the vocal range and working under the key that works best for you. That will dictate your longevity and stamina in the music business. Well done. Thank you. Well, it's something I take a lot of uh, 
something I put a lot of thought into, to be honest with you. And to, and to be fair, guys, I mean, I think that there are a lot of there are a lot of songs out there that the ideal key would have been to do it in F sharp or something, and it got done in G by somebody, and it and it got done that way because of Planet, you know, particularly in bands where they weren't using just like off the chart session musicians and whatnot. I mean, let's face it, I'm a good piano player. I'm not going to I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to be so humble that I won't admit that. But and I can play in F sharp or D flat or A flat, but I don't have the I don't have the range and the depth for fills and solos and and lots of cool stuff in A flat or D flat or G flat or F sharp that I do in C, D, G, A, F, B flat even, you know? Um, so when, when I see that the best key for my voice, and this happens to me a lot, that the best key for my voice is B major with five sharps or F sharp with six sharps, I use the transposer function and drop it, and I either I play it in G or I play it in C. Why is that? Well, because... Again, it's this brain power thing. I I don't really want to take the time to get good enough in F sharp so that the occasional time when F sharp's the best key for me that I can just like kill it with all these great, you know, I don't want to do that. I just want to I want to play what I'm good at. And because now in the advent of this era, you know, you you're playing on keyboards now that have been they've sampled like a quarter million dollar Steinway concert grand a 16 foot Steinway concert grand in a in an acoustically perfect room and that's what the sample is that they're using and then they've got it touch sensitive and all of this the sound that you get out of these new digital pianos is absolutely amazing and let's face it if you're a working musician you're going to need something portable and it's not easy to take an acoustic grand with you. It has to be tuned and it's got to be, it's the maintenance is a real problem and it's harder to mic. It's not as uh, reliable. You can stick a condenser mic in there, but it's not going to get as balanced of a sound as a digital piano. You can perfectly balance the outputs. So just from a logistical point of view, I'm not knocking acoustic pianos. I'm simply saying that from a logistical point of view, when you're a professional musician, keyboards are where, you know, that's what you're going to be playing on. And now they sound amazing. And you can drop the key a half step or whatever. And so I think that there's a lot of folks out there who, frankly, the right key should have been F sharp, but they put it in G because they needed it there to be able to deliver a good performance, especially if they're playing while they sing. And um, then they went out on the road in those days where even electric pianos didn't have transposition. You had to, they were, you know, they had an analog function to it and they had to be tuned and all of that. And they went out and they did it in G. They did it that half step higher for years and years and years on tour. And they just blistered their throat up so that they've got kind of just roughed up, kind of damaged vocal cords. And now they're all having to drop the key a whole step or a step and a half just to be able to come out and perform. And it still hurts them. So I think a lot of people damage their voice voices a little bit by pushing it too hard on tour. And it was because acoustic instruments just did not allow for the flexibility to give you the razzle dazzle that they had in G and and I mean hell think about this with six sharps a lot of the fills that work really well if you're in G they can technically be played in F sharp but it, it, your hand doesn't even lay out right for them because of the the way that black keys are set up so it's like you know I'm just saying those things all come into play. They really do. So I am kind of grateful to be in the era that I'm at because I really do choose what I think is the right key for my voice. And I, and I try never to, to uh, push it harder than, than is healthy for it because I want to be, I want to be doing this and I want to be doing it at the top of my game when I'm in my seventies. That's my goal. 
you know, 35 years from now, I still want to be able to get on, do a live stream concert for whoever is watching out there. And I want to sound as good as I do right now. And there are people who've managed to do that and, um, other people who have not. And so that's my goal. So I, I try to take good care of myself. Okay. Phil says, every song I attempt is in the key of Strangled Cat. <laughs> You're way too hard on yourself, my friend. Yeah, no, you never want to play a lick from an Eagles song. They're, it, it, if it was just about being demonetized, I wouldn't care. I don't try to monetize any of my YouTube videos because they pretty much all use copyrighted stuff. Don Henley will go in and try and take your damn video down. He's like on a jihad for that. One of the few artists who just, you know, somehow thinks that if he just fights the good fight that we're going to go back to the 90s. So I love his singing, but he drives me crazy in that regard. He needs to get over it. Okay, let's see. I feel that some some days on some songs, hee hee, but I just have fun and go with it. Oh, let me see. Oh, I see. You're talking to uh, Ferrum Phil. Yeah. It's a weird kind of fun with pain included, but nothing worth doing is achieved instantly. <laughs> You're right. You're right. There's a gap. There's there's always a gap between what you want and where you are, and you got to close the gap one step at a time. Okay, now here's another fun question. This says, this is from Brenda in uh, Victoria, Canada. Victoria, British Columbia up in Canada. She says, I've seen you use the Piano Man approach method for uh, obviously Billy Joel and Elton John. I've seen you use it for 70s and 80s and 60s and 50s and 90s music. And um, I've seen you use it on crooner music. So you use it on children's music. Can it be used on classical music? So, Brenda, here's the thing. Yes and no. The classical music, by its very nature, is um, a lot more rigid, meaning that they wrote it a specific way and they want it played a specific way. And the Piano Man approach is not a specific approach. It's a general approach. So it works really well for popular music because popular music in and of itself tends to be a little more improvisational, tends to be a lot looser. Uh, and also, here's the other thing. The Piano Man approach is about taking a recording that you heard of an ensemble and approximating it on the piano. So you can't play anything exactly like what they did because even if you copied what the piano player did, they weren't playing to be just piano and vocal. They were playing to be part of a group. And so they adjusted what they were doing slightly to fit the dynamics of the group. So this is, this is an approximation method. Uh, classical music, particularly classical piano music, is written with the intent of it being played exactly how the composer wrote it down, which of course is why I failed miserably at classical music because I, nice guy that I am, do not like being told what to do. <laughs> My poor piano teachers learned this. The hard way. I do. I just don't like being told what to do. I'm a contrarian that way. I am a cat. I'm not a dog. You cannot bribe me with treats and train me to do tricks. I am a cat. I will do what I want and I'll do it for the reasons that I want. And if I happen to do something that you want me to do, it's not because you wanted me to do it. I just happen to want to do it. And you lucked out because you also wanted me to do it. So, but that being said, a lot of good classical music, like the most of the classical music that is really well known by the public, does have some components that make it possible to use the Piano Man approach to do some stuff with it. They tend to have a, a catchy melody that tends to repeat itself. And of course, there's always chords. Now, they don't usually write chord symbols above classical music, but if you get good at ear training like I have, 
you can hear what chord that melody is being played over. And so you can do this. A, a great example, Billy Joel did this with um, Beethoven as a beautiful piece. It's one of the very few classical pieces I've ever actually learned the way it was written. I'm just going to play a little bit of it. It was, it was uh, one movement from a piano sonata that was three movements long called Pathétique, okay? And it's the, I think it's the second movement, and it goes like this. Now, Billy Joel heard that and thought that would make a great doo-wop song. And he wrote words to that melody. Then he wrote another verse around it, but he turned it into this. Just took the chords, basically, and then sang this, this, oh, let me put it in a different key. This night is mine. Now, is that playing classical music with the Piano Man approach? Kind of. But you're not really playing classical music because you're not playing what Beethoven said. But you are taking something Beethoven did and using, essentially, that's a, uh, I actually just taught that rhythm pattern in a, in a video I did for Ed Sheeran's song, Perfect, where you just, it's boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, and three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one in the left hand, and then just one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three on a chord in your right hand. So you can do things like that, and I sometimes do things like that. Um, but you're not you're not going to approx you're not going to approximate what the composers did because they weren't generally writing a groove with the left hand. They had very different kinds of ideas, and they were very specific about what they wanted done with both hands. And it's it's a beautiful beautiful medium, and it takes you know a lot of talent, a lot of practice to get good at that. I never did get good at that. But that doesn't mean that with mine, you know, I can pick out. And I could turn that into a pop song. break that down to its most simple form if you had the chords it's just da -da 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 -da. a minor which you could do over the syncopated feel e7 a minor c g a minor And for that matter, you could do it with other, you could turn it into a country feel song. Or 
It sounds more like a Jewish polka that way, and it's like Hava Nagila Hava Nagila Da 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 Get my Tevia beard back out. I'm in Fiddler on the Roof again. But, yeah, I mean, you can do that. You can take those beautiful melodies that those guys wrote, if it's familiar enough, if you can identify what the chords are, and turn them into a pop song. So, yes, that's what the Piano Man approach can do with classical music. Fun question. Okay, let's check the uh, comments here. Song I've never tried and teacher never told me to try, but now I'll teach. Oh, okay. Let's see here. With the winter months creeping in, I love listening to Trans-Siberian Orchestra and how they transcribe the classics into modern rock renditions. Yep, and that's exactly kind of what they're doing. Now, the, the one thing you got to understand here is that I do teach this very improvisational stuff here, but keep in mind that the bigger the ensemble you're in, the more precise you have to be about what everyone's playing because otherwise it turns into a mess. So, you know, the bigger your ensemble is, the more you have to, you know, flatten out and say, this is your part, this is your part, this is your part because you got to get everybody working together in tandem. Um, when it's just me on the piano, I have all kinds of freedom to do kind of whatever I want because I'm not hinging on anybody else's part not muddying anybody else's water but yeah and that's how you do it you find a groove you find a groove for the song you know um mozart has that beautiful song that's a symphony number 40 or 41 or something like that and you know if I had a guitar player or somebody who was going, it'd be pretty easy for me to like put a little groove under there. It's, it's so it's fun. That's it's beautiful, beautiful music. I actually adore classical music as a consumer. I'm just not good at playing it the way that they did. But there's there's so much rich, so many rich, beautiful melodies that come from that. And generally, what they would do is take a short melody, you know, and then they'd modulate it into a thousand different key changes, and then they just kind of play little games with it do different things with it over and over and over. Um, so it, and that they'd call it a, rec a recurring motif that would just kind of play out in different ways throughout because there's all different ways that you can arrange that when you're working with an orchestra. So amazing, amazing stuff. Not really my specialty by any means, but I understand what I'm hearing when I hear someone who is good at that kind of arranging. Trans-Siberian Orchestra is fantastic. Okay. Nice. That's great. Okay, Ruth. Ruth wanted to ask me a question about a video she sent me of a guy playing Mustang Sally. Ruth likes them dirt-kicking, bluesy, kind of swampy, bluesy songs. I do, too. <laughs> Okay, so what she wanted to know was about this guy's solo. He did some really interesting stuff. So the first thing I want to tell you, Ruth, is he was playing primarily the C blues scale. Okay? He was playing out of the C blues scale. He did some really cool runs where you'd see him go like... And he was just working his way down the C blues scale and just kind of using his thumb and his index finger and kind of a cross pattern and get that run down really good 
and I'm not a genius at that because I just haven't worked it out or I haven't worked with it a lot. But so the notes that he was primarily working with were the C blues scale. But the really cool thing that the guy did was this sort of six, the sixteenth note thing, and. I have not identified the exact notes of what he was doing, Ruth, but here's what I can tell you. He was finding, he was finding like uh, something, he, he would find like two notes from the C swing scale or C blues scale to play together. And then another one, so would be like B flat and E flat and then C and G and then B flat and F, and then back to this. And he was going, and using the C as like a toggle with his left hand. So ba-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Ba-da-da-da-da-da-da. Ba-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, and he just had some tasty, so he's playing along. And it's a it's kind of a cool thing, but it's it's like for the most part, he's using the same note in the left hand while he does the movement in his right hand. And it's just it's basically like the toggle technique. Da 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 and And occasionally, I think I saw him do one fill where he was using the same technique, but he was kind of working his way around and then actually changed the toggle note from like C up to E flat and then back to C. So it'd be like. And when you're getting up to speed, you know, when you get it up to speed like that, it almost doesn't matter what notes you're hitting as long as they fit in that bluesy scale thing. And as a result, just get this kind of cool rhythmic. And I'm sorry, I can't give you more detail about it right this second, but it was a cool enough fill that I actually was going to take some time this week and look into that. I don't get to do a lot of that in my current uh, situation because I'm playing so much by myself without tracks or without a band. And so if I do that, I'm taking my left hand off the bass, and so you lose the bottom end. So I'm not getting to do a lot of cool two-hand fills like I might do if I were playing with tracks. He was playing with a with a backing track, um, so he could incorporate his left hand into that. But it was such a cool fill, I was going to take a little bit of time and, and play around with that. So I might be able to give you a little more clarity on it even Friday. Don't be afraid to ask more questions for Friday, but, um, but I'm going to keep looking into that one because that was... That was a, a really cool, a really cool maneuver, and I don't think it's actually going to be that hard to pull off. But I just need to study it in slow motion a little bit more before I uh, before I start trying to execute it too hard. I just kind of want to get an idea of what notes, you know, like. But I know they were all kind of blues scale based notes. So, but those runs where it's. He was pretty much just working his way down the blues scale really fast. One and a two and a three and a four and a, and just to, worked it out so that he could do it. Thumb, index finger, thumb, index finger, thumb. Really, really cool stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes, he was. He was basically playing a drum fill. It was pretty cool. Okay. Mustang Sally, we can cross that one off. I think I have one more question on here that came in in advance, and I think I have just enough time to answer it, and then we're probably going to have to bring this particular session to a close. We'll get together and do it again soon. Um, and I guess since I went out live... Uh, even though I didn't mean to, anyone who's on YouTube who is enjoying this sort of thing and would like to be a part of the Piano Man Approach uh, student community, it's a Facebook group, and um, you're more than welcome to look it up. It's called the uh, Piano Man Approach student community on Facebook, and you can join it for free if you've got a Facebook account. And uh, 
you're welcome to be a part of that. Um, great group of people in there posting content and all of that. And we do this uh, once a week. We're going to do it twice this week because last week I had a tech issue and this is actually a, a reschedule. But you're more than welcome to come join us there. And then if you're ever interested in the Piano Man Approach course, of course, there's plenty of material to give you an idea of what that's all about. But anyway, the last question here is from our friend Daniel Dirksen in the Netherlands. He wants to know, what am I doing in, when I play Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash, and how do I do the solo? So here's the thing, Daniel. Folsom Prison Blues, I was playing it in the key of G, but it starts on a D chord, and it's basically the country feel with some frills. So it's a D7 chord. Do, 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 do. G. So just that simple country feel is where we begin. But then I'm doing, I like to do this. I like to go da-da, da-da. I like to do a little toggle. Da-da, 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 da-da. So it's almost like it gallops like a horse. I hear the train is coming. Rolling around the bend I ain't seen the sunshine Since I don't know when And what I mean by toggle, of course, is You play the chord with the top part of your hand Toggle to your thumb Ducka, 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 ducka And it, you know, it can be very, very effective As a little variation on that basic country feel it Doesn't matter whether it's a three-note chord here Or if it's a full, like, octave chord like this. And it just really does a lot to add a little pace and, and texture to that. So that's kind of the basis of what I was doing in the song. I hear the train come rolling around the bend. I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when, and of course it's not, like I said, I'm not a robot, so sometimes I'll just, sometimes I get the toggle in, sometimes I don't, but I'm just kind of putting it in sporadically wherever it feels good, and it just adds that texture, it adds that spontaneity, it adds a little bit of extra, a little extra hot sauce there to your, to your tamale, you know? And that's what you can do basically all the way through the song. Now, when you get to the, to the solo, I, I just remember that the, the guitar, I, I always heard the guitar is going, okay? So what I found was, if I just played octaves, I figured it out on just octaves first. I picked it out as A, B, D, E, D, F, D. And I just kept my, my country feel left hand going on there. It's just on a G chord. And then what I discovered was I could just put my hand down, my, my index finger down, a third above my thumb, and just follow the key signature. I didn't play any notes that weren't in the key signature except for this, this dominant seven, okay? And I just kept that third there and it became... kind of did a good job of capturing what the guitar did and then eventually the really advanced version was then I came down and I put this finger down on a third above that and again just kind of followed the key signature along with adding in this 
dominant seven there, that F. So really slow, it was like. And when I got it up to speed, it's like, you know. Out in my head and cry. And then we'd get into that part. Hey! And then on the C, I just kind of messed around on the C swing scale a little bit. And that's, that's an advanced lick, but it's something that I figured out where I just... One E and a, two E and a. And I've found that with, with, the, C, with the swing scale and in a key where it fits nicely in your hand, like C and G and D... There's like two positions. There's the one where you're here and then the one where you're here, right? And you can kind of do the same maneuver just on the notes of the swing scale in both positions and work out a little fill. So it's like I'd be da-da-da-da, and then I'd do the same thing in this position. Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. So. Oops. And then I just followed that guitar line. Da dun 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 dun. I just play that in octaves. I don't even try to play a chord with it. It's just D D D F sharp F sharp D F sharp D B flat A G. Seating in a fancy dining car. And there you go. You know, so that's, that's how you break it down into the different sections of the song. And yeah, I'm using some more advanced applications of my method, but I should be, you know? I mean, I, I should be to the point where I'm always using advanced applications. I've been doing them for 30 years, but it could be broken down into you could do a very effective version of this by just doing the rhythm pattern. <laughs> When you get to that, just play octaves only. What's that? Then just go to a C swing scale and... That's actually a lick that I teach in the deep dive. So just something simple like that. And then just kind of return to the rhythm pattern. So, you know, there's always a way to scale it back that still sounds good. That's the thing I love about this method is that you can always reduce it to the lowest common denominator and it still sounds good. And then you can dress it up by a layer and then dress it up by another layer and enhance it by another layer. And you never run out of room to keep enhancing it as your skills grow, which is why 
using this method keeps songs fresh, whereas learning how to play it one specific way, you chew all the flavor out of the gum by the time you learn it because there's nowhere to go with it. So for me, even though I play it similarly every time, the song is always alive and always changing just subtly. And maybe nobody else perceives all of the little changes, but I feel it because I'm not doing exactly the same time every time. So there's always a chance for that song to be something new. You know, there's always renewal with things for me because I'm not locking myself into one specific thing all the time. And so songs stay very much alive and very much new. And, and I get to experience something unique every time. So it's what I love about the method, whether you're playing at a beginner level or an advanced level. Okay, guys, it is 90 minutes on the nose. I think I managed to get through all of the questions that came in in advance, and I picked up a few from the, uh, from the chat thread as well. And I know I missed a lot of what was in the chat thread because we had a lot more people than we normally have due to my little YouTube happy accident. Again, we'd love to have you if you want to join us over in the Piano Man Approach student community. We can do this on a regular basis because uh, I generally am not going to run these to the full public. But uh, I always enjoy this. You guys, my, my people never leave me hanging without interesting questions. And we just keep digging into it at deeper and deeper levels, coming at these same concepts from different angles. You know, you get to see how this works on different songs, different genres, different eras. Uh, so I love it. Keeps it fresh for me. And hopefully it's just helping you guys understand the method better and better and better. And, uh, and the more tools you got in the box, the greater potential there is for you to find joy. So that's what it's all about at the end of the day. So I'm going to get out of here for now. I hope you all have a great week. Everyone who's in the student community, remember we will resume our normal Friday schedule. Uh, for now, we're still at 3 o'clock on Fridays. But uh, if you guys would prefer to do this at 2 on Fridays, like I've changed the concerts to 2 o'clock on Sundays, uh, why don't you drop a comment about that in uh, the Facebook group? And if I see that there's enough of that, maybe we'll change it over. Um, but we started doing these at 3 back in the day, and so I've continued to do it at 3. Um, but I'm, I'm open to your suggestion on that. And uh, we'll call this one a wrap for now. Remember, if you're not having fun when you're making music, you're doing it wrong. Have a great week. Happy playing. And thanks for joining me, everybody. It's a great way to start my week, too.